Thank you, Amanda. Well, today I want to take you to Philippi, and on the screen there is a, an image which I've replicated on the leaflet, and it shows uh, a view of the current archaeological site at Philippi from a satellite. And uh, you might find that of interest uh, if you think you will. Uh, you can see I've used it as a, an icon for our, our thinking today. Uh, it's uh, from the Atlas from, uh, of From Space. And uh, there are a number of shots of Philippi, including the modern city that's there. And this is the archaeological site to one side of it. And I quite like the idea of being on the road with the Apostle Paul, partly because we can't be on the road anywhere else, really. Uh, we're allowed to go five kilometers at the moment from our homes in Melbourne, uh, and we have to be prepared to answer for where we are. And, and there are some nice aspects. Last night, Christine said to me at around 10 o'clock, listen how quiet it is. And, and it was quiet. If there's a north breeze, we can normally hear the noise of the freeway in the distance, but there was no freeway noise. And there were no cars racing down our street. And it just seemed so peaceful. <laughs> so let's not get too used to lockdowns, of course. We know there's a downside. We're only too aware of that. So today, I want to take you to Philippi. And Amanda has read the central section of this uh, chapter to us, uh, hoping that you will look into the beginnings and the ends as well, because I'm going to allude to them, but I want to deal primarily with what Amanda has read. And this, uh, this is the view of, as I've said, of Philippi, and I've marked in yellow the Via Ignatia, a great Roman road that ran right across through Macedonia, across the top of Greece. You could sail across to it from Italy and then walk across this, walk this road. And when you got to the Dardanelles, you could cross... A, into Turkey, and there were other parts of the road network, which I showed you on previous uh, leaflet. So I want to think about a Philippian triptych. Triptych, of course, is three pictures which tell a story. And I think Luke has intentionally given us uh, a story in the passage that Amanda has read to us that I want to think about. But first of all, there are some awkward challenges, and there's a difficult team split to be thought about. Then we'll come to a dream itinerary. Why did Paul cross the Dardanelles? And then we'll want to think about that triptych in some more detail. So two quick pieces of reflection and then that the bulk of our reflection this morning will be on this third point. And then finally, there is a postscript which has changed since I first mentioned it in my thinking and in the leaflet. So uh, there are two uh, copies of the leaflet uploaded. Uh, Ken has advised me he's uploaded both of them. Let's get on with this then. Let's think about, uh, first of all, a difficult team split. You remember the message came up from Jerusalem. The Bible says it came down because Jerusalem's elevated, but when you're heading north, I always think of going up. So that's just a geographical thing I have. Okay, so the message came down from Jerusalem, to Antioch. And uh, the message was that uh, you didn't have to be circumcised to become a Christian, a believer in the Lord Jesus. You didn't have to become a full Jew. Full Jews were becoming Christians, but so were Gentiles, and they didn't have the same impositions upon them. And when that message was taken there um, by um, Judas Barsabbas and Silas, uh, they rejoiced in Antioch at the news. And after a time of teaching and strengthening the church there, it says at the end of chapter 15, um, Barnabas and uh, Paul decided to go further. And Barnabas suggested that they take John Mark. Um, in some Bibles he's called John and some he's called Mark. Uh, but this was a nephew. And if you remember the first missionary journey, John Mark turned back early on. We're not told why. Ideas range from being homesick because his mother had the big house in Jerusalem and maybe he was missing home comforts. Or maybe there was something else. It could have been any number of things. But Paul didn't want to take him because he'd already turned back once. Barnabas obviously wanted to give his cousin a second chance. 
uh, and, and so they went off together. There was a split. In fact, it was an acrimonious sort of split. The actual Greek word that is used to describe the emotion is the word paroxysm. And that word has come straight into English. And the disagreement was so sharp. Uh, and the word paroxysm in English never corresponds to anything like the fruit of the Spirit. So we're reminded here right at the start Luke is describing something. It's a descriptive narrative. And he refrains from commenting on the behavior, but there's no excuse for this kind of uh, strong, uh, violent disagreement. Something that makes one agitated, red in the face, and upsets one. So what we're discovering here is that even among the apostles, uh, tensions and uh, those things that so can easily characterize us, they're, they're there too. We're not talking about saints of God who are stainless steel and bulletproof. We're talking about people like us. That's in, in some ways a comfort, but it's a challenge as well. What happened as a result of this, of course, was that two missions emerged. Barnabas and John Mark went down to Cyprus, where Barnabas was from. Uh, Paul and Silas turned up into Turkey, going around the corner uh, north and, and west. And, and uh, they, they went through uh, a, a narrow valley, which is a, a gateway uh, where the Roman road came down into Syria uh, f- from crossing Turkey. And, and they discovered that when they got uh, to the first of the towns, it was actually the last of the towns they visited on their first trip to Derby, uh, they, they met uh, Timothy. Timothy was a young man, and he obviously inspired uh, Paul. He had a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother. He was Jewish. The Jews decided a long time ago that a man's, any given person's paternity had an element of doubt to it, whereas who your mother was was pretty clear. And so the Jewish uh, citizenship and uh, nationality was passed on through the mother, and so Timothy had a Jewish grandmother, a Jewish mother. His father was Greek, and he had never been circumcised. He'd never been welcomed into the, the Jewish community by that right. And so Paul thought that this man, had, with, with his potential, should be circumcised, and he had him circumcised. And there's a complication there that you might like to check up. You might remember that earlier on, uh, Titus hadn't been circumcised. There was no need to, the apostle said. That was the issue that they took down to Jerusalem. Why is Paul now arranging for Timothy to be circumcised? And the answer is that in the case of Timothy, uh, his, his, his circumcision was a strategy that would enable Timothy, as a Jew, to be recognized and accepted in the synagogues because that was the mission strategy, to visit the synagogues first. And Timothy then would enter as a fully Jewish member, even though he was a believer in Jesus and had been a believer before he was uh, circumcised. So there's, I'm just making this point that there's a difference between these two circumcisions. One was uh, because people were saying that the circumcision should take place in order to become a Christian, and that's not the case with Timothy. It was a strategic thing, not a mandatory thing. So that's getting the team together. Now we're going up this road, we're traveling, and where are we going to go? Well, there are Roman provinces all over the place. I'll show you a map in a few moments, um, but uh, a map which marks the provinces. And uh, we, Asia, we're told in the narrative, was blocked. Asia was the south and western side of Turkey in those days. And Bithynia, uh, up in the north and east, was also blocked. We're not told how it was blocked. Maybe it was some trouble in those areas at the time. The Spirit of God wouldn't let them go there. So they continued moving across Turkey until they came to an area called Troas. Now, as Australians, we know uh, that this is up in the area of the Dardanelles, all right? We're, we're up where Australian troops uh, fought in the last century, uh, 100 years ago uh, or so. so. So this is a part of the world. Uh, it's famous because Troy is in that area, but Troas is the region. 
and they, they get to Troas. And we're not told how, but Paul dreamt there of a Macedonian call, a call across the water into what is today Europe. That was what he was uh, envisaging. And I want you to notice this, that, that it, it tells us in the text, we sailed from Samothrace. Now, that by this device, it's most commonly accepted that the author of Luke and Acts is putting himself in the boat with the Apostle Paul. In other words, the team has continued to grow. And they're, they're in the boat together. And Paul, the beloved, sorry, saw, uh, <laughs> Luke, the beloved physician, presumably kept notes and created the narrative later on for our benefit, for the benefit of those who needed to know this story. So Luke is suggesting that he was in the boat with Paul and, and, uh, and Silas and Timothy. And this is the, the map of the area. You can see the provinces each in a different color. Each province, of course, had a procurator in charge of it. Uh, and we've left Antioch here. We've crossed through the, the gates of, of this region, this valley up here. We've reached Derby where they picked up Timothy. And they can't go into Asia, they can't go into Bithynia, so they're sort of forced to cross through to uh, what's labelled as Masia and the area of Troas. And that's where they decide. Let's look at it a little larger. They're going to cross from Troas by Samothrace to Neapolis. Neapolis just means new town. So there was a new town on the coast there. And then further up, the, the Via, Via Ignatia was the Roman colony of Philippi. Philippi was named after Philip of Macedon, uh, a famous uh, Greek military uh, king who traveled and subdued this whole area and whose son Alexander be basically conquered the, this whole part of the world by the time he was 33, died at that young age. He had uh, taken from Greece right across to the Indus River. Uh, it was all the Greek Empire. That was why by the time the Romans came along, they conquered this part of the world, but they kept the Greek language. Greek was the common language. And here we get to Philippi, a Roman colony where this Roman ex-servicemen were settled. There were so many people out of the army uh, who sort of graduated through military ranks that uh, were retired, that they didn't want them all in Rome, so they built colony cities. So if you were in Philippi, it, it was as good as being in Rome. Your status was that important. And so ex-servicemen were stationed there, and the, the city took pride in, that, in its status as a Roman colony. But we notice that it had no synagogue. On the Sabbath day, the apostle... Uh, Paul, Silas, Timothy, they went down to the river where there was a place of prayer. We're going to show you that in a minute. But this uh, qualification was necessary. You needed 10 heads of families to form a synagogue. And without that, Jewish people would associate together. They would uh, pr have prayers and so on. They didn't worship at the local pantheon. They didn't accept the Roman or the Greek gods. So they believed there was just the one God. And like Cornelius, whom we met earlier in the book of Acts, there were Gentiles who were attracted to this. And we're going to hear about one of those in particular. And that is uh, the beginning of what I've called the Philippian triptych. So this is an aerial view. If we come back to the ground, this is a photograph of Philippi from the land, it, it's probably not so clear uh, to you viewing on screen, uh, but it's the best we can do. What we've got here is the forum, where important uh, decisions were made and taken. The uh, agora, which was the marketplace and meeting place of the local populace. And behind that, there's a basilica. A basilica, there are a couple uh, I've noticed from the aerial images. Uh, this one, uh, I believe, dates from the Either the fifth, I'm not sure if it's the 5th or the 2nd century. But there has always been a sort of a Christian presence there because 
that this is where Christianity arrived in Europe. And the road running through is the Via Ignatia, still runs through the middle of town. And if you come further down the road, you'll find the theatre, right? the amphitheatre built into the hillside. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure if the river, this is my own geography, is not up to it, but I'm not sure if the river is a bit further down that way or a bit further down that way. I suspect it's down this way and in the valley. But uh, there is, the river is where they gathered for prayer. And who do we want to think about? We want to think about a woman named Lydia. She's a businesswoman. She trades in luxury fabrics. Particularly, I mentioned, is purple fabric. Purple, <coughs> purple was the uh, top end of the market. It was uh, what the, the wealthy could afford. It was an expensive dye to uh, dye your fabric purple. It was a sort of, I'm told it was a resh purple. I'm terrible with colour. I've got red-green colour blind, so you have to just uh, let your imagination go to work with red, purple. So there we go. But how do you get it? This is more interesting to me, perhaps my engineering background, but it's, it's produced from uh, the excretion of thousands of snails. Some sea snails or some land snails both give the kind of dye that you need to get this. And because it requires so many snails, it, it made it very expensive. And being rare, it was expensive and coveted. And this is, the, this is what she deals with. She's a businesswoman working at the top end of the rag trade, as they used to call it in Britain. And, and she's down there, and she's with those who want to pray. And she hears the message about Jesus. And it's winning. It's a wonderful message. And, and it takes her, takes hold of her heart. Uh, in the message version, Luke tells us the master gave her a trusting heart. And she became the first convert in Europe. And what she does is straight away she offers hospitality to the messengers. And she invites the, the group to stay at her place. Obviously, it would appear she had a home that was big enough to accommodate probably four guests or more. And so Lydia... His, her heart was open, and so was her home. This message mattered to her, and it became precious, just like that. Now, that was a great start. Um, but the next thing that happened is, the next day as they're on their way to a place called prayer, the, the apostolic group is harassed by uh, this uh, group of men who have a slave girl who tells fortunes. Uh, the actual word that's used to describe her is a python girl because there is a, uh, a Greek legend that a python enabled people to tell the future. You, it was from this part of the world, or from Turkey actually, but I, I don't know the whole story, but the Greek text actually uses the word python. But what it means in our terms was that she was psychic. She could see things. And, and she could see that Paul and Barnabas were, were something else. And so uh, she, she becomes such a disturbance to Paul and that he turns and he asks for her to have the, in the name of Jesus, to cast out this, uh, this spirit that enables her to uh, see things, presumably misleading people as, maybe, as well as maybe leading them. We don't know. But straight away she loses the ability. She can't do it. And you would think, well, how amazing is that? And how good is that? That she's freed from this spirit that, that actually made her precious to the men who owned her. But the thing that struck the uh, men that owned her was their livelihood was gone. She wasn't worth anything to them now. Now that she was not troubled in this way, now that she wasn't reeling and recoiling from the things she could see, she wasn't worth anything to them. And so they stirred up the crowd against Paul and Barnabas. They said, these are men who have visited us. They're not from us. They're not among us. 
Now, we're Romans, and this isn't the way Roman people behave. They stir up the crowd, and Paul and Silas are imprisoned. Well, you would think there's an enormous setback, but Paul and, Barnum, Paul and Silas are not seeming to be set back. They're in jail, and they believe that they're where God wanted them to be. And you know, it's possible to be in chains and free. It's possible to be locked down and yet find yourself inheriting so many good things. The book of Acts is going to take us to a place where Paul is imprisoned, but he says the last words of the book, Luke tells us, is the word of God is not chained. Here, Paul and, Bar Paul and Silas are chained, but they're singing hymns. They're praising God. They're having a great time in the jail. We used to sing a song about this, I think, but I can't quite remember it now. But that memorable night, they're singing in prison and presumably other prisoners are saying, what's going on here? And, and that night, the whole prison is shaken. That's an earthquake region. These things happen. Most of the buildings are in ruins. So, so what's going on? The doors fly open. Things are thrown out of kilter. Chains are loosened. And as soon as he sees the door open, the jailer, most likely an ex-serviceman, pretty hardened, used to the sight of death, sees the open doors and thinks, they've gone, the prisoners have gone, and he's about to kill himself because he knows that that's what happens if you let prisoners escape. You get killed. We're not used to such brutality unless we, unless we turn on the TV and listen to the news. Today it's like that in some parts of our world. So the town jailer, about to take his life, terrified, but Paul calls out, don't do it. We're all here. None of us have fled. And distraught and trembling, he calls for a light and he falls at the feet of Paul and Silas and he asks for help. What must I do to be saved? Now what he meant by that probably didn't carry all the freight that Christian history has added to the idea of being saved. After all, the word for saved uses, also, is also translated as healed, restored, and made well. But, but clearly he was troubled, deeply troubled. And in the context of his world, he knew that he needed something. And I think he got a lot more than he expected. He got the message about Jesus. He got rescued in a way that he never imagined. And like Lydia, he takes them home and he provides uh, amelioration for their wounds and he, he feeds them and he gets the, the message about Jesus. And this message, as, as it was with Lydia, this message has a strange power to get inside people's lives. And that's what happened to him. And so he was baptized that night. His family were baptized. They become believers in Christ, that Roman jailer. In my, in my uh, copy of the Good News Bible, this image of Annie Valentin's uh, is there in chapter 16. It's just one of her simple line drawings showing us uh, somebody holding a light in the jail and the jailer on his knees. What must I do? And so it is that in that city we now have a woman named Lydia an enslaved girl and a Roman jailer all become Christians. But what's the significance of this? Well, if you download the leaflet, which uh, has been posted on the website, thank you, Ken, um, you'll see that I've included a daily Jewish prayer. And this is a prayer of Rabbi Yehuda, and it says this, a person is obligated to say the following three blessings every day. Blessed are you, our God, King of the world, for not making me a Gentile. Blessed are you, our God, King of the world, for not making me a woman. Blessed are you, our God and King of the world, for not making me a slave. Now, what are we discovering in Philippi? We're discovering that the blessing of God has come to a Gentile, to a slave, and to a woman. You see, we might think 
that the way to build a church is to get key personnel. But no, the way God builds a church is to begin with the needy, those whose hearts are open to the message, and those whom we would bypass, and those whom this rabbi encouraged people to pray, to ignore in their prayers and not to be like, they are the ones uh, who receive the blessing and become the foundation of the church in Philippi. So you see, I've called this a triptych, meaning that it's a, it's a kind of work of literary art in three, in three scenes. And these are the scenes. And if we know the background of the prayer and the attitude that was so common, we're challenged. Who would we not want to be? And what has God done for us? And what has the message done for us? And what does that remind us about who we are really and what are we like? And what, by the grace of God, we might be? Now, the story goes on from there. The next day, the civic authorities say to the jailer, release those, they can go now. But uh, when, when Paul and Silas are told this, Paul says, no way, they can't throw us in jail, they can't treat us like that and throw us in jail. We're Roman citizens. When the civic authorities heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were greatly affected. Why was that? Well, I've also included in the leaflet this week a little narrative about a Roman procurator on the island of Sicily, a man called Verres. <clears throat> Verres was a terrible man. He abused his power. He stole from the homes that he was overseeing in, in, the, in, in uh, Sicily, and he made himself very wealthy, and he surrounded himself by people whom he bribed. And, uh, and so he was hard to dislodge. He was secure in his corruption and his power. I guess uh, we can think of modern parallels to this. So how was he to be dislodged? Well, a young barrister named Cicero decided that the case against him had to be made. And so Cicero outlined the case. And as he researched it, he came to this, that Verres had actually taken one of his critics and had him crucified. And Cicero discovered that the man he crucified was a Roman citizen, and even from the cross, he had proclaimed his innocence. And so that, that became the heart of Cicero's argument. Now, this was 70 years before Christ, all right? But in this part of the world, the Roman Empire, governed by procurators across all these provinces, the name of Verres and the name of Cicero lasted because Cicero's case was that Verres had crucified a Roman citizen. And people knew, and especially people in Philippi knew, that you couldn't do that, not to a Roman. And so when, when Paul says, we are Roman citizens, the civic authorities are shocked. They hadn't, they hadn't checked out that. They hadn't thought about that. And so instead of hurrying, scuttling out of Philippi, Paul and Silas go to Lydia's house and say goodbye before they head on their way. And they do head on their way. And I'm sort of thinking it would be lovely to go down the Ignatian Way with them straight away. That was my initial plan. It was going to take us to Thessalonica. And I love Thessalonica ever since we did a series on Thessalonians last year, or the year before, I think. Um, but what I want to do is to talk about, just a moment, about the later letter. Because Paul sent a letter to the Philippians. It's a letter... Uh, characterized by joy. If you go to BibleGateway.com and uh, search for the word joy in the letter to the Philippians, you'll find how many times it occurs. It's a th great theme. And in the second chapter, you'll find a hymn, a hymn to Christ. And it's believed to be one of the earliest Christian hymns written into the text of the New Testament. And uh, and I thought to myself, I, w I wonder if that was what they were singing in that jail in Philippi. That and other hymns like it. So instead of going down the Via Ignatia, in the next few weeks I want to just dally a little bit in this later letter, probably written ten years later, 
So uh, from the early 50s to the early 60s, a letter written from jail, from another jail, and uh, we'll find some encouragement there in the uh, next few weeks. In the meantime, may God bless his word to us all, and to his name be the praise and glory. As we think about these things, I am going to invite Amanda to come forward. She's going to play for us uh, some music, uh, Minuet 1 and 2. I wondered why I chose a joyful minuet to play in, in this context. Now I know, Graham, it's in 3-4 time, it's my own little oh, Bach's triptych. Um, this is from the same first uh, cello suite of Bach in G major. There are two minuets. The first one is in G major and then he journeys into the minor and then he goes back to the major. First minute. Thank you, Amanda. Now we come to our time of prayer and our prayers of intercession uh, as a result of the week that's passed and what lies ahead. So I invite you to uh, join with me in heart as we bow and pray together. 
Almighty God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us to turn the tide of human affairs and to bring healing and restoration into the lives of men and women, boys and girls. Thank you that the message about Jesus can be shared and transmitted to bring faith, hope and love into our lives. Thank you that faithful people have committed it to writing and that in the Bible we have the encouragement we need to live as your people. Forgive us that we so easily fall short of Jesus, our Lord and Master. Like Paul and Barnabas, we allow disputes to separate and divide us. Amazingly, you so graciously can override our sins and make bad things work out good. Thank you that Jesus revealed your concern with the whole world and that Lydia, the slave girl and the jailer all mattered to you. This week we have sensed the terror of so many in Afghanistan who have helped and supported the failed Western mission in their country. We pray for all who are at risk and pray that many may yet be brought to safety. We pray for a better future and for the safety of all in the troubled nation of Afghanistan this morning. Our hearts also go out to people of Haiti who have suffered yet again in a devastating earthquake. Comfort all who mourn. Bring relief to the suffering. Help us to play our part in supporting the aid agencies that are there to serve in Christ's name. We pray for Christian brothers and sisters seeking to worship you in such difficult and dangerous places in the face of wars, earthquake, famine and the scourge of COVID. Build your church, O Lord. As the incidence of Delta variant, of the Delta variant increases and the lockdowns in Victoria tighten, guide us in our behaviour not to put others at risk and to take up the vaccine slack. Guide our political leaders so that damage to businesses is reduced and people do not see their livelihoods lost. We pray for those whose mental health is at risk through lockdown, young and old experiencing imposed isolation, people working from home while managing small and school-aged children, those predisposed to anxiety, business people fearing financial collapse. Keep us mindful of others, kind in our thinking and communicative. Thank you for the inspiration and care of Stephen Moylan and the willingness of the Regals to pay part in helping one person recover from COVID. May each of us do the good works you have prepared for us in the weeks ahead. Help us to do it as unto you. We think of frail elderly and sick friends and family this morning, who along with parents of school children will face added complications in an extended lockdown. Please bring encouragement and hope to them now as we commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. We ask, Lord, that they might cast their care on you and know that you care for them. We ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you real good. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen.